Hello, everyone. Can you can you hear me okay? We'll just just make yes, a start. Yes, sure we can. Yep. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, we'll just make a start. There's people joining still, I think, but we'll, we've got a lot to get through. So hello and a very warm welcome uh, to you all. My name is Nikki Cronin. Um, I'll be your host, first time host um, for today's webinar. We start with, uh, thought we'd start small. I think we've got about 500 uh, registered either to come along today or for the, the video link. So that's fantastic and it, really exciting for us and a little daunting. But um, my job anyway today is to guide you through today's webinar, which is to formally launch our technology good practice guidance. So you're very welcome. I should probably say a little bit about myself. I started work as an electronic engineer working in the computer sector, then we trained and worked as a social worker for a number of years. Moved to the care, care inspector in around 2006 and I've been working in inspection and methodology before moving to my current post, which is Senior Improvement Advisor for Technology Enabled Care. My, my role also forms part of the tech digital social care team. So I'm about six or seven months in, in post. Um, so really big thanks to all of you for, for taking the time to register. I know how busy um, you all are, but I think we have some really interesting speakers on the agenda today. So I hope you, you find it useful. Next slide, please. So I've just got some house, housekeeping to go through before we make a start. The, the webinar will run for 90 minutes, so camera off if you don't want to be uh, recorded because we are recording today and on screen. So uh, unmute your mic, you know, unless you're coming in to, to, to speak. We've got a chat and a Q&A function, which is slightly different for teams, which you can use. And we really would encourage you to, to get involved and engage throughout the the webinar we want to make this as interactive as possible so if you look at your top of your screen you'll see there's an option to click on both the chat and the q a they look like little speech bubbles um so if you have any specific questions for the speakers pop them in the q a and anything else you can just use the chat as per per normal we've got live captions available if you want to use this feature then click the three dots towards the top right of the screen and choose a language and speech um, we will email everyone a copy of the slides um, who's registered probably sometime next week and we've got an evaluation form in the chat uh, at the end of the webinar so we'll post that in the chat and if you can feedback uh, that would be great it would really help us uh, we've got technical support behind the scenes. We've got Jenny and Stephen uh, with us today. So if you've got any issues, please put, put a message in the chat or if you get sort of it in or, or anything, you can email improvement support at kinspectorate.gov.scot. So hopefully I've got everything there. Next slide, please. So this is our agenda. We, we thought the real benefit of today would be to hear from services and more of a case study approach. So I will talk a little about the guidance itself, but really the theme will be on practical examples. We, we may have short time after each speaker for questions and comments, but I think there'll be, we'll, we'll wait till the end predominantly for a bigger space for, for questions because we do have we, are, we will be tight for time. So delighted that three services spotlighted in the guidance have agreed to come and chat with us today about their work. So we've got Emma Smith from Hollytown Nursery. We've got Anne Craft, Louise Labonte and Andrew Burns talking about their work with Frank Fields House, Abelour. And we've also got Amanda Lacking and Sue Lynch from Dunheith Care Home and Barry Wilson from the, the SC. <laughs> So lots to get through. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to start just by acknowledging really the amazing work taking place in practice. In this role, I'm, I'm learning about some of it, but speaking to inspectors, I get a sense I'm just scratching the surface. So 
people are really seeing the benefits of technology and getting stuck in, which is great. And people who said they couldn't turn computers on a couple of years ago are really going above and beyond. And I just wanted to acknowledge this and the, the great work that you are doing. Um, technology is now integral to all our lives and good, good quality care is no different. We use it in so many ways, but the, be the benefits require good digital skills, good internet connections and the right de devices for everybody. And the pandemic highlighted a number of barriers and, and digital exclusion was shown to have a significant impact on people. So we need to start where people are at and find out what they need to champion good practice where, where we see it. So hopefully we'll see some of that that today. Um, so ne next slide, please. So just to talk to you specifically about the technology guidance, I was trying to think what would be useful to know, you know, at a webinar, and I preempted some questions, but of course you can ask your own in the in the Q and A. So what is it? It's it's a good practice resource guide around using technology to improve outcomes for people. If you're familiar with our inspection quality frameworks, you'll see it has similar illustrations mapping out examples of very good and weak practice in specific areas. There's also a section on practical examples of how digital devices can be used in different care settings and also a section on the difference good, good use of digital technology can make. And we also have a, a case study section where, where there are 10 spotlighted uh, care services from early years, children and young people services and, and adult services. And there's also an improvement focused toolkit of resources at the end. So why have we published the, the, the guidance? Really in response to an, an increased reliance on digital technology and connectivity to meet people's care needs. We thought it was the right time to produce a guide to highlight good practice principles, principles based on human rights and, and having the person at the centre. Who's it for? It, technology has been used in all settings and as such our guidance sits across all service types. So it's it's written for everyone and for inspect, our inspectors as well, looking for, for standards and good practice for their evaluations um, and our regulatory work. So where does it fit? It fits firmly within the context of the, the Digital Health and Care Strategy, Scottish Government Strategy, which was published last year. It's got a number of priority areas, including digital access, digital skills and leadership, and enhanced digital services. It's a people first approach, which promotes digital choice. So again, essentially starting where, where people people are at. It, they get our guidance linked strongly to the health and social care standards as well, and that technology should be used to support people to exercise their rights and enable people to be independent and have more control over their, their health and well-being. And it also builds on what we have in our quality frameworks on technology. So when can it be used? Really, it's it's a resource tool, so you can use it whenever it's useful. It's, it's designed for self-evaluation and for improvement or to find out how you know tech can work in your own area of work or other areas of work. So it's um, it's a genetic guidance, so really it's to find, find links to other digital information and resources as well. There's, there's so many good practice documents out there in, in this space, and we've tried to signpost you to some of them at the, the back of the, the guidance. So next slide, please. So in the theme of today, I wanted to share a, a practice example of our own improvement work at the Care Inspector, and I think It'll be useful as it fits within the principles set out in our technology guidance, and it, it does relate to children and young people services, but the message is absolutely relevant to other groups. And the project uses the, the model for improvement, so if you're not familiar with, with what that is, I'll post a link to that in the chat, but the model provides an improvement process to follow, really, so it's, it's about having an idea for improvement, getting a team together, generating ideas, and, and then testing these you know, before any kind of decision on implementation. So that's the kind of process we, we, we followed. For our project, the idea was that we wanted to improve how we involve and inform children and young people in our inspection feedback. So we got a core team together, which involved myself, um, Andrew Nelson, um, one of our inspection colleagues, Glasgow City Council, uh, and the children and young people and staff in three care homes, uh, but lots of others all, along the way, including our young inspection volunteers. 
So we we gone together to talk about different ideas that we might be able to test in relation to feeding back to children and young people, and we landed on three kind of three ideas really, which were face to face feedback after inspections, uh, letters and also a feedback video. So our first test, we did a face to face session, visited uh, the care home post inspection. Uh, and we really sort of focused on four key areas, which were thanking children and young people for their involvement in the inspection, summarising their feedback and, and findings in terms of the things that were going well and things that could be you know, improved, and also provide an opportunity for the manager to, to speak to the children and young people about their improvement plan. So that, that was test one, and we, got lot, we did lots of kind of feedback and questionnaires after the, the test, and we got some great feedback, but it was felt a, a video, a feedback video would work well in terms of extending the reach and, and getting to more children and young people which and giving them information they could access that at a time that suited them. So for test two we decided to create a video feedback which we could send to children and young people po post inspection and yeah if the technology works we'll now show you our first uh, feedback video as just a, a test at this, this stage. So Thank you to young people of Broomfield Crescent who took part in our recent inspection. Your views were central in helping us understand what it's like to live in Broomfield. What were the things that you thought were going well? Most of you told us it was a cracking house and a great place to live. You told us that you felt safe. You told us that the carers and the relationships you had with them made a difference. We heard that your rights had been respected and your views were taken seriously. You told us that the carers helped you get better and to feel better. We saw that everyone's needs were prioritised and you were treated as individuals. When you found things difficult, the care team had the skills to support you. If you made mistakes, the care team kept you safe and helped you learn from those mistakes. What did you tell us could be better? Some of you found it difficult when the house got damaged, but we saw the carers trying to fix this quickly. So what next? We didn't find any changes that we wanted managers to make and we graded you very good, which is absolutely terrific. Should you wish to get in touch with your inspector in relation to this or anything else, please speak with the Broomfield manager. Once again, thanks very much for your involvement in this inspection. We would be grateful if you could give the videos a thumbs up or a down to let us know what you think. Thanks, see you later. So I'm really grateful to children and young people from Broomfield Crescent and uh, Glasgow City Council for involvement in, in the project uh, today. It's just that's really just a PowerPoint slide we've recorded in, in Teams uh, and sent via Vimeo to, to, to the service, which is an online video sharing service for, for those that, that don't know. So it would be great to hear any feedback or, or questions you have around you know that that project that we're working on just now and as i say it's, it's just a test and and yeah i'm grateful to glasgow for allowing us to share that uh, today as well but the point being the guidance was really important in terms of this project thinking about how technology could support improvement and, and participation of in this uh, respect children and young people so ne next slide please Right, so next steps really, um, I see the guidance is a, a first step really and I've, I've put some ideas forward for next steps but again it would be great to hear from you about ways in which we can share what we're doing in practice because I think that's really um, going to be so important um, as things are moving really really quickly and perhaps through forums like this you know if that would be helpful so I'll not read, read th through these and um, yeah, I'll just I'll I'll stop there, and I'm just aware of with time. But if there's any any questions coming through, we'll take one or two before we move on to the next speaker.
Yeah, I see there's some to be back there. Just from Jason, interested to see one with more challenging outcomes from the inspection. Um, and visual inspections were summarised like that. Yeah, it was a good example, and the outcomes were re really good. Um, and yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it would be interesting to 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 see that. I think one thing we're we're keen is that we're just summarising really the feedback that we've got from children and young people in the inspection, and not getting into all those kind of processes, perhaps, or other areas of the inspection that you would feed back to the to the management team. So it's just about summary, summarising what they've said and and keeping it uh, keeping it focused on that and probably light, you know, and, and quick in terms of the feedback that we that we provide. So thanks for the comment. I'm not in the Q and A. I should check. Okay, so, sorry, sorry, Vicky. Um, there was a question there from Aidan uh, McCrory just saying it can be applied across all care settings, ELC to older people and adults and everything in between. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And even in the, uh, the guidance, we've got examples from practice from all, all those um, settings as well. But yeah, really, this, uh, the, the ideas and the, um, the practice you know, areas that we focused on really apply to all, all different types of service and, and, and service types and, and user groups, really. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, we'll move on. Um, we've got Emma Smith from Hollytown Nursery Class. Uh, Hi there, thanks, thanks Nikki. Um, hi there, I'm Emma. I am the deputy head teacher of Hollytown Primary School, um, and we have a three to five nursery class attached to the school as well, um, which I have the responsibility for. Um, so we were asked to come along today um, just to talk a little bit about how we have used technology in one area um, of how we are trying to improve outcomes for the children in our care, um, and that out. The area is QR codes. Now, probably a couple of years ago, nobody really um, had much experience of, of QR codes, but certainly in the last couple of years, um, they've become more and more prevalent for lots of different things. Um, I know even now still in a lot of restaurants and bars and things, you're having to order um, using QR codes on your devices and things. So most people will be quite um, familiar with QR codes. Um, and this little presentation really is just talking about how we have used them within our setting to try and improve um, outcomes for the children and for the parents as well. Um, next slide, please. So when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, um, I had a wee discussion with staff about our digital journey. Um, pre three years ago, um, digital technology looked very different for us um, at Hollytown. And we started, um, we had computers, we had laptops, we had a couple of iPads in the nursery, but really we weren't using them to their um, to their best use, I would say. Um, and it was really just for play. Um, so when I asked staff about our digital journey over the last couple of years, the, here are some of the words that they, they kind of came out with. Um, and you can see the big one in the middle, challenging. There's no getting away from that um, for a number of staff. Um, the intense use of digital technology that we've we've kind of taken on has been quite challenging. Um, but there's lots and lots of other words around there that are really, really positive um, about how it really connected us, um, how we use digital technology over the last few years to help support families, um, how we've been quite innovative with it in different ways and different things that we've used. Um, and how it kind of brought us together as a staff, actually, um, because everybody was sort of in the same level playing field we've got staff with lots of different levels of experience um within the nursery setting and it kind of brought everybody together because a lot of the things that we were having to do teams being one of them um was a new thing for lots and lots of people for most of my staff actually um so it actually really connected the staff as well and gave them a um, something that they could learn together which was really really positive and really useful as well um next slide please So what I'm going to talk about today is our use of the QR codes. Um, so I've just put a little 
brief um, overview of what the QR code is for anyone who isn't um, entirely sure. So it's a quick response code um, and it's a two dimensional version of the barcode um, which you use a mobile device or um, an iPad or something to scan um, and it'll take you to some other piece of information. Um, so it's simple, it's an online tool. We use it with links majority majority of the time linking to things um, that maybe we've recorded and uploaded to YouTube or that are online links um, and we use a generator just a free generator that's on um, online and you literally can just google free QR code generator and they, there's loads of them come up and they're really really straightforward and easy to use um, and you can create your own set of data on there that can be created securely and then the, the QR code is just the access to it so it just takes you to whatever it is that you have um, already created or made. Next slide please. So how do we use them in nursery? Um, obviously our children um, are very young, they're three to five, um, but we use them loads in the nursery now. Um, we have them in lots and lots of different places, which you'll see um, as we go through. So the main kind of ways we use them now are to support children's learning and play. Um, we also use them to document the children's learning um, and we use them heavily to involve families and to report to parents about what's happening within the nursery as well um, and to seek views of parents um, to, to involve them within um, everything really that we do in the setting now. Next slide please. Oops, I think if we can pop back one, I think that's a second. Yeah, thank you. Um, so supporting children's learning through play. Um, so I've got QR codes displayed around the setting. Um, children have free access to, we've got a, quite a number now of iPods and iPads available for the children. And they use these um, to scan the QR code, which takes them to all different things. So you can see in some of the photographs there, you've got some children um, scanning and accessing the codes. So there's, um, in books, we have all of our books now. I say all, most of our books now have a QR code attached to the front of them, which the children can scan and either use an iPad and earphones and sit and listen to it quietly, or they can have it on the iPad, eh, the iPod, sorry, as well. Um, and it links to a video of either a member of staff reading the story, um, or sometimes it's to a YouTube link of the story being read as well. So the children can follow on with it, follow along with the book and the pages, but they can listen to the story. Um, so it allows them to have free and easy access to books without having to have an adult there to read it to them. Um, quite often the children like to do this in wee groups, so someone will scan it and then they sit together and read the story, which is quite nice. It's quite a nice way to bring them all together without having an adult to facilitate it. Um, we also have them dotted around the room in different areas of the nursery. So in the kitchen, we have QR codes um, leading to different things. So we have um, videos of staff, you know, baking and doing things like that. Um, we have them in the sand pit um, and they've got um, videos of children who've been building things in the sand previously. Construction area, we've got links, um, QR codes in the construction area as well with different um, images of things that children have created, slideshow images of um, different things that children have created as a stimulus for children. So we have them for all different things around the nursery um, and the children are just really really used to now going around and scanning and seeing what the QR code is. Um, we change them regularly as well so we can change the data that's um, you know in the QR code we just print off a new new QR code stick it on and then um, we've got a new set of information for the children to access. Um, the picture at the top there you can see is um, children's hand prints they were doing some of the children were looking at numbers so they had wanted to do it with their hands and the number of fingers and things and underneath it there's a QR code of a wee rhyme that goes along with the number that the ch it's the children saying the rhyme so it's actually their peers that are on there and um, so they're viewing the code and it's their peers saying the, the rhyme that goes along with number one, number two, number three, um, which the children love doing. They love seeing it when it's their own self or if it's their friends, they love scanning those codes. Um, and we have them around the nursery in lots of different areas, um, children doing things. You know, we've got a musical area with a stage set up and things, and there's loads of wee cap codes around about that of past performances that the children have done that we've recorded. Um, and they just love going up and scanning them and seeing what the, the children have been up to. Next slide, please. 
Um, we also, as a result of COVID, um, have created now something that we've continued to do. Um, we've got a weekly virtual playroom um, that is just made through PowerPoint, um, but the link takes the, the QR code link takes the children to the PowerPoint and it's got loads of different activities on it that the children can do um, at home. So we did these, um, they weren't using the QR codes, but we used to just send the links out to parents um, through the COVID times, um, but now we just give them the code for them. They can scan the weekly playroom and on there there's stories, there's practitioners, um, you know, there's this practitioner sitting on the chair. You can see there when they click on that, the practitioner, that's them reading a story. Um, we've got some Sid and Shinari in the middle, which is one of the um, resources that we use for wellbeing. Um, any of the things around the room, the children click on, it takes them to something. So the QR code now gives the parents access to these every single week. So we have a new QR code set up. Now the whole playroom doesn't change, but elements of the playroom change. Um, so if the parents go to the QR code, they don't need to click a different one every time. They just need to scan the same code and the, the changes will all be there from them. We also use it as a way of celebrating some of the children's achievements. So there's some stars on the wall. Um, you can see, and we have links to um, some of the children's achievements on there as well so things that they've achieved in nursery we'll put up photographs and we comment on there as well and they can be accessed through that playroom too um we also use the qr codes alongside written comments and photographs um of the children's learning which we have around the nursery um so the photograph there you can see there's um it was about nursery past and present what the nursery used to be like before we had changed the environment and things um, and there's children's comments which we always would have put up but now we've got videos of children speaking and things as well so we don't need to always rely on a practitioner right now so it means that the children can access what those comments are because they can't read them so if they're on the qr code they can see a video of their peers or maybe it's them telling us something and we're including their views um, and as part of their learning to go alongside some of the photographs and some of the, the written comments that are there as well. Okay, next slide please. So we also use a QR code now to help with us documenting children's learning. Um, so in our setting we still use um, a hard back book um, to record our children's learning. Um, we did used to use online learning journals, but we decided to change back to um, a proper paper copy for lots of different reasons. And it was done through a consultation. Um, so the children own these wee books. They're, they're called My Wee Book. Um, so the, the children absolutely own these and the staff print all photographs of their learning and they document their learning. Their targets are all in there. Their personal plans are in there. Um, it's basically their journey from when they start with us in nursery all the way through to the day that they leave. Um, and then that book then goes home with them as a, a memento and a memory for the parents. But it also helps us to document the children's learning um, and be able to track their learning and their progress with their targets and everything inside it as well. So we felt this was a really good opportunity for us to be able to bring the books to life. Um, so you can see in there, um, in a couple of the photographs, there's children scanning the codes, but the codes are just printed off small and it's linked to videos of the children doing things. So it's not just a photograph that you're having to expect to bring to life yourself, you're actually seeing what's happening there. So for a lot of parents, um, they have commented that they really, really like this because they feel that they're not missing out on a lot of things that are happening um, and that they can actually see live their children taking part in things and achieving things that they maybe you know, had been something that they've been working on for ages and they, they, they're doing it really well in nursery. Um, and it's something that we then can use as well as evidence. So we... Um, yeah, so we, we use them lots um, at, within the books and it started off, it was maybe one every every few experiences, but now staff are so confident in using them that they ha it's an, such an easy, quick way to convert it from the video into the QR code that they pop up all over the place. Almost every second page um, comes straight into, into the um, QR codes and they, they go straight to the videos as well. So um, a really, really positive way to bring some of the children's learning to life. Next slide, please. Um, so involving families and reporting to parents is another way that we use them quite heavily. Um, parents are really comfortable using the QR codes and I think they're using them more and more in their own daily life. Um, so we are able to um, continue to use them to support that. So we've got our newsletter that goes out um, every month and it's on a QR code on the wall and the parents can scan that. We scan the children in and out now as well. It's a secure Microsoft form where the parents can sign their children in and out. Um, using the uh, the QR codes as well so we don't have any paper signage anymore and it means that quickly if we need to look for something we can just 
go straight onto we've got the form set up in, in uh, the office. We just click onto it to know what's happening with children coming in and out. Um, we also have question of the month. So we get feedback from parents and we put up, we've got a display that's got child parents can um, vote for things and they can give us feedback and information. Um, we use physical like we pebbles to do that. But when we couldn't do that um, because of COVID, we started using the QR codes for a vote. So we've continued to allow parents to access both ways um, to see which one they can, um, which one, which one they prefer. Um, we also have devised a monthly learning sway that um, parents can access. So we used to send out a wee kind of overview. Here's what we've been doing this month sort of thing. Um, where now we don't have to send that out. We make them on a sway, a Microsoft sway, and we just give out the QR code. So the parents can scan the QR code, all the photographs of all the learning that's been going on within the nursery um, and any events or anything that have been taking place and things like that are all on that sway. So it's we use sways during COVID to give children activities to do at home and to provide them with learning, but now we use it more as a way of reporting back to parents. Once staff became familiar with how to use the technology, we thought we're running with this, we're not stopping using it now that we don't have to, we're keeping going and the QR codes have allowed us to um, be able to um, really be able to link that as well. Um, so yeah, we use them alongside the written comments and images and things to share the feedback too. Next slide please. So challenges and benefits, um, you can see from the size of the font that there are far more benefits we feel to using the QR codes than there are challenges. To begin with, the access to the hardware and the devices, that was a big thing because we didn't have um, really enough technology or good enough technology, I would say, um, which we have managed to invest in, um, not just for that reason, but we have invested in it's made life much easier. Um, a new skill for many staff um, and parents as well and quite time consuming to begin with till you get your head around to use it. But now staff, you know, are really confident in using it and really quick um, at being able to convert things. So it's it's really straightforward. Um, so that I feel is one that's kind of we've managed to kind of overcome, but there's no getting away from it. It is a wee bit time consuming to set it all up to begin with. Um, benefits though, we've got quick and easy access for parents and carers to information. We have a number of parents who literally don't have time in the morning to stand and have a chat and here's your newsletter and make sure you know it's a case if they can come, they can scan the code and they can have that quick interaction and then they can go and their views are still counted, you know, so if it's about the feedback and things like that, they're still getting their chance to, to comment and to give feedback through the use of the QR codes. Um, We've got that they can be anonymously shared if, if necessary as well. Sometimes if you send out a form or send out a feedback form, it comes back and all the parents know who it's from. If it, you know, it's, it's an anonymous way as well. Um, we can share the learning quickly and easily with parents as well, which is a, a really good benefit we found. Um, bringing the learning to life, loads of families have said that that's, um, that's been a really, really useful way um, of, it, you know, being able to use them, that they can actually see their children uh, taking part in things and easy for the children to access independently. Um, it's amazing how quickly the children pick things up. You know, they picked it up probably quicker than the staff, to be honest. Um, and it increases their independence and their choice for their child for the children and their learning. Um, we've managed to come up with ways of doing it securely, um, a reduction in printing and copying as well as paper, and developing children's use of ICT naturally within the environment as well. Um, so, yeah. We've, we've really, um, there's lots of things that, we, that we've managed to overcome. There's still some things that if we were to do things differently, if we had to go back and, and do things again and that we're looking at making changes to already. We've found the, um, that the newsletter, some of the information that's in the newsletter doesn't seem to be getting to the parents. So we're like, are parents actually reading it because they're not being given a physical newsletter? Um, so one of the things we've discussed is putting on a sticker on the child as they're leaving the nursery. Um, you know, here's a sticker, please can you please scan me for the newsletter sort of thing so that the parents aren't having to do it at pick up drop off. Also good for people that have child binders and things like that, they can still have the access to that too. Um, so that's one of the things we've said well, we would try and overcome one of the issues by doing that. Um, but um, yeah, that that that's really it, and that's really our use of um, of the uh, the QR codes within nursery. It's definitely been a wee journey, and we've definitely started using them so much more. Um, but if anyone, I don't know if the next slide just really says any any questions. If we can put the next slide up, if anyone had any questions, I could see some popping up, but I wasn't able to follow them all through as I was talking. But um, I can see some popping up. Emma, that was yeah, that was fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. I can't believe all the uses you've you've got for the, the QR codes and all the yeah the way you've involved the families and um, yeah well done it's been as you say quite a journey for for the 
for staff. There's been lots of the uh, chat coming in there, but I'm I'm aware of time, and yep. um, we'll go to them. You know, maybe have a look at them, and we'll go to them at the end. I think, and we'll just we'll move on to the next speaker um, yep. just now. But brilliant. Uh, Thank you. So we, We've got Anne Craft, Louise Labonte, and Andrew Burns from Frankfield House. Thanks. I can unmute myself. Yeah, you're on. Oh, you're back on mute though. Andrew, you're on mute still. Yeah. Right now, Andrew, we're, um, should be set up as presenter. Yeah, that was you. It just went on. It's maybe just a little bit of a time delay there, Andrew. Yeah, that's you. Oh my goodness. Okay, really mm -hmm. sorry, right? Yeah. OK, so sorry, I am Andrew Burns and not very good at muting and unmuting myself. Um, I'm a research fellow at the University of Stirling and I am working on a project just now with young people and adults at Frankfield House um, around creating an online digital archive. So I guess just to give you a very brief context, there's been quite a lot of work, quite a lot of change around individual case records for children and young people who have been looked after away from home. There's been a lot of problems with them in the past in terms of access, the kind of content that is, that's in them for, for, for young people if they want to access them when they're, they're adults. And there's been quite a lot of research, quite a lot of changes in practice around individual case records. Um, but one of the things that individual case records don't necessarily capture for children who have lived in residential childcare is the fact that they live within a group context for a period of their life. Yeah, they live with other children and young people and adults. And the idea around this project was to explore whether we could develop an online digital archive that would allow these young people to reconnect at some point in the future, if they wish, with the everyday group life at the residential uh, children's home, which is something that as people who live in families might be able to revisit family homes, revisit people that they used to live with, have ongoing stories. And for children and young people who've lived in residential childcare, that might be more problematic uh, for them. So next slide, please. Um, so what we're, we've been doing is what we call a participatory action research project. And so some people might be familiar with that more so than others. So what that basically means is rather than researchers like me coming out and just doing interviews and then going away and deciding what happens, what we do is we work with individuals or groups or communities to identify problems, design research so that we can find out what we need. And then the action part, we try and take some action within that as well. Um, so some system will change or some something will be developed as part of that. Um, and then the research part, we try and learn from that so that we can then pass on that learning to other people as well. So this has been this has been a, a, a multi-phase project. The first part, we look back, actually, so past, present, future, we look back at the Aberlour Archive from 1920 to 1980. So going back to the days of the large-scale orphanage right through when it moved to smaller group homes to look at whether and how everyday group life was recorded in the past before we moved to more individualised kind of case records type things. And we've taken a lot of learning from that. And what we're in just now is the, the kind of second phase, the, the present, if you like, working with young people at Frankfield, working with adults at Frankfield and hopefully working with care experienced adults who are away from their care experience a wee bit now as well to develop this, this archive. So we're working with them to figure out what kind of content might they want to have in an archive. Uh, will it be photographs, videos, stories, other things like that? Who should have access? Who should have control? How should consent be be organised around this, you know, for, for the young people, what would make them what would make them feel comfortable. 
um, and for the adults as well. And so it's quite a complicated project, as you can imagine. There's lots to consider in terms of not just individual c- consent, but data protection, other policies and procedures and complications uh, around that to try and make it. Um, and so what we hope at the end of this, the action part, so working in participation, the action part is that we'll produce this online space where um, artefacts, if you like, are kept and that uh, young people can log in and reconnect with pictures of where they live, people they live with, stories from that uh, in, the, in the future as well. So we'll have this piece of action that we're hopefully going to deliver. Um, and then we're going to we're going to track how that's used and monitored, and also the other part of the research that we understand how all the decision making's been been undertaken, what have been the barriers or the opportunities, have we been able to take the opportunities, have we been able to overcome the barriers, and if not, why not? All of that into some guidance and training, free guidance and training materials for any other kind of group living environment or any other care environment that might be interested in undertaking a similar project. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, I think I've just, I've covered this one really in what I said in the last slide, the, the three phases, the past, we look back, the present, we're going to create this archive of the future, we're going to monitor how it's used and see how that develops uh, as well. So we can move on to the next slide again. Uh, yeah, and one of the interesting things about this project is an international project. So we're working with partners at the University of Osnabrück in Germany. And so what's happening, what we're doing in this project with Frankfurt in Scotland is happening simultaneously in another children's home in Germany. And they've also looked back at an archive as well. And the reason that we're doing that, I guess, this is very much the research part of that participatory action research. Germany and Scotland, there are some similarities, but there are also some uh, marked differences in the way that they deliver residential childcare and have delivered that over the years. Um, different traditions there, um, a bit different in terms of the legal context and the practice context, but also some shared challenges between the two countries. So we're interested to look at whether doing this project in the two countries throws up the same types of challenges and opportunities and what we can learn from comparing and contrasting the two sites on this and that will be fed into the guidance and the training, the free training materials as well. So there'll be a, an international context in that as well, which will hopefully um, improve the learning from the overall from the overall project. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, as I mentioned, we're in phase two just now in the process of um, really trying to develop the actual archive. We've had quite a bit of initial conversations with young people and adults who live and work at Frankfield, and we're in the process of undertaking some semi-structured interviews with them, um, looking at um, memory, memory keeping, and also asking them questions about the archive around those aspects that I spoke to you about earlier. You know, what would they like it to be in? What do they think about consent? What about access? All of those kind of things. Who should control it? Who should who should um, decide on these things? Um, we ha- are designing a completely new system for this. Um, I mean, there's lots of arguments. You could say you could do this with a Facebook group or you could do it with existing social media. The challenges around that are... Um, you don't really own the data. There's a lot of data protection issues. You don't really own the data. You could set up a Facebook group. Meta owns the data then. Um, they could start charging for their services. They could go bust. And you can't transfer that data and then your archive would be lost. So we've had a look at the existing technology that's out there. And what we're looking at, we're getting something new that's going to be free free, free, and easy to use. And that's been done by um, uh, technology people and the German team. Um, we need to seek a view from the Information Commissioner just to check that we've got our I's dotted and our T's crossed around data protection and all those things. And we need to set up the appropriate processes and procedures alongside uh, young people and adults at, at, at Frankfield. So I think that's probably a good summary of the project. I don't know if Anna or Louise want to come in and say anything about it. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. So when Andrew approached us to work alongside the children and the adults and ex-residents to create a living archive, 
we thought about our memory books that we have for our children already, but we thought this would complement that in a digital way and move us forward. And you shared some lovely feedback with us also from the German colleagues who were really impressed about the memories we've captured and how accessible they were. Louise? Well, we kind of thought, you know, how, how will this benefit our children? So our aim is to form lifelong attachments with our children and capture the memories to support them to feel that their time with us is valuable, it's been valued and that they feel loved. We feel that capturing memories in digital forms would appeal to our children, you know, young children, they love technology, um, and it will support them to engage and take part in the process. So I guess one of the major benefits that's came from this as well is one of our young people, um, she's been fully involved in the project from the start and has just secured a 14 hour post yeah. with Stirling University as an assistant researcher. Um, she's absolutely buzzing about that. She loves the fact that she's got um, a uni ID, a uni um, email address as well. And I guess the main thing from that as well is, you know, her experience being brought up in care, you know, that is valuable and she can use that to teach other people. So I'm very grateful to you guys, Andrew, to, yeah. for giving that to to. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So what we are hoping to gain from this process is for our children, to, when they move on to their own tenancy, they'll have their memories in paper, but and in digital form, so it'll feel more alive. There'll be no black bags or files of paper with redacted bits in it, which leaves huge gaps in their memories. This will bring alive their journey with Frank Field and I hope in the future, when they look at their archives and their memory books, they're still able to feel that, that love that was put into them for them, rather than feeling unvalued and big black strips through all their, their stories. It's going to be a narrative that's smooth and just brings it alive for them. So again, I, I mean, I thank you for that as well, Andrew. Thank you all for, for that. I just think it's an amazing piece of work you're doing there and um, such an interesting project, you know, um, so important for young people, you know, as we know, to have those those memories and access to the memories. And yeah, I think there'll be a lot of people watching and interested, you know, in, in, in what you're doing, um, the comparative stuff with, with Germany as well. I think that's really exciting just to see the different barriers as the project uh, develop so I'll definitely be keeping in touch with you to hear about that and thanks for the presentation that was great we'll, we will just skip on I think keep going um, just in terms of time so we we have next we have Amanda Lachan and Sue Lynch from Dunheith Care Home just to talk about some of the work they've been doing with digital so floor is yours Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Amanda, um, Care Home Manager, and I have with me one of our assistant managers, Sue, who does a lot of digital work with our residents because she's our activities uh, champion. So we're going to take you through Dern Heist's journey um, of digital technology. Um, next slide, please. As you can see, this was us in the office pre-COVID. <laughs> Um, sometimes it feels like that just now, but uh, we had no Wi-Fi, no smart TVs, no tablets, just the basics to get us by. Um, but we are progressing. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not going to read every slide on here, um, but it explains to you the effects we had with COVID when we went into lockdown. Um, it affected the communication of residents with families and the outside world. Um, it was uh, a very difficult time um, living with dementia, trying to make a telephone call to someone that you can't see um, is very distressing for the family. So your phone calls then become about how's mum doing, how's dad doing, how's granny doing? And it's not the interaction with the family. So as a care home, we had to act on this. Next slide, please. So what we did to make things better, we uh, introduced some digital technology in the way of some big smart TVs, iPads, um, Wi-Fi throughout the building, 
Um, and we use this technology in various ways to be able to connect with the outside worlds. Next slide, please. They're not seeing the slides. Some, some. Um, we also invested in this large interactive tablet. Now, this is a great piece of technology because you can program it so you can go to various places around the world. You can take residents back to where they used to live and they can see where they used to live. They can play games on it and they can play it in pairs or they can play, you know, just a jigsaw puzzle on their own. Um, you can also use it just as a touch screen that creates shapes and patterns. Um, it also creates animals for you because a lot of our residents love the animals. And obviously through COVID, we couldn't allow this to happen, have pets in. Um, so this was the next best thing. Next slide, please. We've got smaller tablets, and one of the things we used those for was to um, interact with the outside world through the big TV because our residents love the little children, and it brings a you know it's a light to the eyes of most of our residents. So we connected the small tablets via the internet to our big TVs so that we could interact with the young Welly Walkers. These are preschool children and have been coming to Dern High for a very long time. And that was good because the children could still interact with our residents and our residents could interact with the children. And it was just great to see. And then at the end of last year, when restrictions lifted, as you can see on the second picture along, the uh, young children are back in the building, which that was a fantastic, good experience to experience um it was like first time all over again next slide please our ice cream van um it came around and it was very quiet so with the use of technology um we was able to use a bluetooth speaker and play the original ice cream van music um, it was great to hear it and to have it stop outside the door. It took you back to your own childhood. Please, can we uh, come and have an ice cream? <laughs> you know, it, it just takes them back to when they were younger. It's just great. Next slide, please. So Christmas time comes along in the middle of COVID and obviously families can't come in. You've got your window visits, but it's not the same. So staff created videos with some families and they put it all together to create a slideshow um, that we played on the big screen so that families could see their own families at home. And that was a great way to have entertainment for the residents and be able to see their own families until again in December 2022, we was able to have the families return to the home, which was great. Next slide, please. We also use our small tablets for 10 minutes of fun. And we do this twice a day. Uh, it can be um, a various things, but we tend to have a lot of music, a lot of dancing, a lot of exercising happens through this 10 minutes because people don't realise that they're actually exercising when they're having fun. And we play various kinds of music from a very wide range and the residents enjoy it and all staff just attend. You know, when we first started this, it was like, oh, do we have to go and do this? But now they just attend it because it's fun and that's what it's meant to be. Next slide, please. Um, in this slide, you can see the gentleman. This gentleman in this slide wearing this headset is 84 years old. And he was the first one of our residents to try one of these headsets um, because we're currently working along with Stirling University to see how digital technology may or may not improve memory with dementia patients. 
Um, so it's it was quite an interesting day. It was quite an experience for all. And um, I'm looking forward to John Ritchie from Sterling coming back up because he is bringing us some different technology to try. Um, he's got some wee robots and if he can get his hands on it, there is a walking machine and you put a headset on and you can walk and that can take you through the forest. It can take you to the parks. It could take you to the beach to give some of our residents that aren't quite as mobile as others an experience of being outside. Next slide, please. I've included our tri shore bike because it is electric, so it is a little bit technology. Um, this enables our residents to get out and about around the local area. They love it. They get to meet old friends, but they're also making new friends. And that is really, really important for our residents to be out in the local community. And I have to say, everyone managed to get to Port Soy show this last year and it was great for them all. And the last slide please. Not sure where we're going in the care homes but this could be the future, who knows. Thank you for listening. Great, you can just see all the thumbs up and the applause coming through now. Um, that was Brilliant, uh, really inspirational, uh, Ashley, to, to hear what you're, what you're doing. Just uh, the value shine through just in terms of the work, work you're doing and how you're, you've used technology. What, what an effort. I love the ice cream, the ice cream van. <laughs> Such a great <laughs> idea. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll just we'll keep, keep moving on. We've got um, a final, final speaker, um, Barry uh, Wilson, coming up now. Don't you go, Barry? Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, as Nicky was saying, I'm Barry Wilson. I'm part of the digital learning team in the SSSC in the Workforce Education and Standards section. Um, and what I'm going to do today is just give you a wee bit of a, 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 an overview, very quick overview of the, the work that we do. Uh, next slide, please. Right, I'm not seeing anything at all now in the slides. I'm just seeing a blank screen. Uh, I can see okay. Right. Well, I've got my slides here, so what I'll do is I'll talk, just talk through them and just tell you when I'm going to change to my next slide, if that's OK. Yeah. So basically, hopefully you're all seeing the picture of the um, digital um, health and care strategy there. Um, and you see underneath it, I've put priority for digital skills are seen as a core skill for the workforce. So basically what that means is that everybody has to have, have some degree of, of digital skills to support uh, people. Um, now, we're not talking about turning everybody into computer programmers or anything like that. And uh, quite often there's a misconception that folk are going to have to go back and retrain and things like that. What they're looking at is basically your, um, you know, the type of skills that people would normally have themselves in their in their home lives in terms of being able to use things like uh, like video and that, uh, video screens and calls and things like that. And maybe uh, being able to look up stuff on the Internet and Google. So, ah, brilliant. It's back now. Right. So. SSSC has, has a remit to support uh, workers. We can't expect folks to just go off and do it by themselves. And so we've, we've got, the, got the, the, a remit to actually help and, and, and develop that. And as part of that, we've created a lot of free digital resources uh, and we also deliver workshops. If anybody on the call or in the webinar wants us to deliver workshops to, the, to their staff group, then we, we can do that. And you'll, you'll have my, my contact details at the end of the slides anyway. But the idea of that is that we can actually help support workers to, to gain the confidence uh, and, and as it says there, the bottom, the bottom point, people often already have those skills, um, and uh, uh, there's, there's still, for some reason, uh, an artificial barrier. Quite often, where folk will be able to use skills, digital skills, in their home, home circumstances, personal lives, and when they come into work for whatever reason, you know, I didn't, I, I can't use technology, I don't use technology, that kind of thing. So what we do is we try to build on that, and one of the ways of doing that is uh, next slide, please is 23 things digital this is a this is a, a one of the one of our first 23 things resources um, now we're often asked why is it 23 things well basically what i'm told is it was a, a librarian across in america who was looking for ways of getting, encouraging folk to use the library more and just staff group to come to, to, to think about 
Uh, what each think about one way in which folk could actually do you know, use the, the library more. She happened to have 23 staff, so they came up with 23 things. It could equally have been 22 or 25. But anyway, it's a model that we've borrowed in inverted commas from um, Edinburgh University. And they use this, uh, this model for supporting uh, students when they first start at the university. So they, they kind of agreed for us to, to actually use that model. Um, now, as you see there, it's short learning activities that are designed to build together to actually make a bigger one. And what I have to say is it's definitely not linear. So it's not like you start at activity one or thing one and work your way through thing 23. The whole idea of this is it's very flexible. So folk will, or might already have existing knowledge and skills in particular areas. So they don't have to do that again. They can concentrate on the, the, uh, the areas that they want to develop. Uh, and we know that from, from our own experience that uh, it does help folk to develop confidence in, in using it. And what we've also done is quite purposely, quite deliberately, sorry, is that we've um, created things so that people can actually link to their home lives as well. So one example of that would be about your digital footprint on, um, you know, in terms of social media. And quite a lot of folk don't realise uh, how, how much of their, their information when they go in and search things is actually stored. So we, by explaining that to folk, they can actually relay that to their own, their own circumstances as well, and it helps them to, it helps to put things into context. Um, one other thing is that each of the things or topics has a, a My Learning Badge, which is a way of being able to um, recognise the learning that somebody's done. Uh, and uh, what they do is they, they actually, there's a criteria for the badges, and they, I'll explain that a wee bit in, 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 in a minute, but it allows folk to actually get some recognition for that type of learning that they would probably would not normally have got beforehand. Um, okay, next slide, please. Another thing that we do with as part of that is the, the, they've got another resource there called Staying Secure Online. And what we have to get across to everyone is that it's everybody's responsibility to try and stay secure, avoid getting scammed, that type of thing. It's not just the person who's responsible for IT for your organisation. Um, and again, we can help. One of the most important things we did from this was to, make, to let workers uh, see that they can actually identify potential risks when they're going in to support people. So, for example, if somebody's going in to care at home and the person's on, on, on uh, Facebook, and they're, they're saying, uh, they're tell, telling everyone, I'm going to be away for the next couple of weeks on holiday type thing, then, you know, that's, that's a, that, you, there's, there's a risk there for them. Um, or if they're uh, uh, sharing personal information on Facebook and not realising it, the worker can then hopefully identify that that's potential risk and help, help provide guidance to, to the people they're supporting as well. Um, next slide, please. I mentioned the open badges and my learning badges. Uh, that, um, image on the, on the right hand side that's the the the, the app that we've got it's, it's a smartphone app at the moment that uh, allows folk to, to do learning and create create their learning save it and then be able to get uh, apply for open badges um so the, 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 can, it's help, the idea is to help folk to gather evidence on the go so they're not having to run around if say for example in registration they're having to think about what they've done in terms of continuous professional learning and run around and try and think about what they've got and what, what they did and when that this, the, the app can allow folk to um, do that on the go and, and create, create learning logs. Uh, it also helps them in terms of uh, keeping an eye on their, 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 their CPL as well, so they make sure that they're, they're, they're getting their hours as they go. It's, it's got a smartphone app there that's um, Apple and Android, uh, which you can download from either the Google Play Store or, or from the Apple App Store. Um, but in, in response to feedback we've had from people, we've also put in a, we're, we're also creating a plug-in for PCs and laptops because some folk came back to us and said that they, they, they prefer to use laptops and, and, and that type of thing for uh, recording. So that's if it's not already in there, I need to check with the guys who are developing it. It will certainly be in the next iteration that comes out. Um, but the idea of it is it's to, it reduces the duplication. Because you can write your, your learning log. So if somebody's done something around, say that they would say that there are 23 things and they've done a learning log for that, then they, they can, it can be pushed through automatically to, 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 to create evidence for the open badge. They don't have to repeat that again. All they do when they go and log into their badge um, or go into the badge site is the, the, the down the, the right hand, the left hand side, sorry, would be a list of their logs. And all they have to do is drag the log into their evidence box. And then apply for it. So it's not. There's no uh, the idea is to try and reduce this duplication for because we're we're very very conscious of the amount of time you know that people have and uh, you know there's, there's there's so many demands on 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 people's time. We don't want to make things more difficult for them in terms of recording their CPL. 
So as I said at the bottom there, it actually does. You can you can set it so you can keep an idea of your of the, the number of hours that you've done uh, and and set different learning learning uh, sort of um, uh, milestones and times uh, and targets. Sorry as well, so that you can actually keep track tracking of that. Uh, and and like all of our, our stuff, it's free to use and free to download as well. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, from this, uh, this is something that's coming coming out for us. It's not it's still it's still in development, but we're hoping it will be available from the end of April, beginning of May. Uh, so this is the technology Twenty Three Things Tech Technology Enabled Care. So it uses the same model as Twenty Three Things Digital. So it's twenty three small activities that that people can use. Each one will then will have a badge attached to it. Um, people will be able to look at the different aspects. We've grouped them into different different sections, but uh, so that um, people can and there'll actually be milestone, what we call milestone badges for each of these sections. So if somebody wants to collect or, or, or do the work on the badges for a particular section, they can get an, an additional badge for that, saying that that's the area that they've, they've covered. Um, it's a basic awareness of tech, so it's not it's not designed as a, it's not going to be a, a qualification in tech by any means, but it's it's an idea for for all workers. To be able to have you know, to, to be able to have a basic awareness of, of, of tech uh, and build on the digital skills. Um, it's a, again, it's a flexible learning. So the idea is that it, people can dip in and out of it, and when they when they can, it's the, and it's not a linear thing. So they can you know they can go in and look at particular aspects. So for example, if they're looking at there's what section on wearables and mobile mobile devices. If somebody wants to go and look at that first, because that, they're maybe looking at having a, 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 a query or a question about supporting somebody who's using wearables, then they can go directly to that. So each of the 23 things stands alone. It doesn't need to be done in any, in any particular order. Um, and as I said, they'll have the, the the badges that people can apply for as well. Uh, last slide, please. I think this is yeah. So these are these are my contact details um, there. Um, please get in touch. With, I know this is coming going out to people uh, next week anyway. But if there's anything around uh, digital learning or anything we can support, or you want us to come out and do workshops, for example, well, most of the workshops will be online to be to be fair at the minute. Uh, but we can, we can occasionally do come and do face to face workshops. Um, but that's my details there. There's the learning zone uh, there as well, where you can find out all our um, resources. Uh, the My Learning Badges is the, a link for that as well. And as I said, um, please, please get in touch if there's anything, because we want to try and respond to, 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 to make, make our stuff as responsive as possible. Right. And thanks very much for your time. That's great, Barry. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Yeah. You covered a lot um, and the workshops, what a great offer. You might be inundated. <laughs> oh, that would be great, yeah. yeah. We've done lots <laughs> of workshops and, and what the, the, the great thing about it is that, you know, we, we, we have folk who come in quite anxious about using digital skills and then when we actually go through things with them and actually go through things like iPads and all this kind of stuff and stuff online and they see that they're not going to be asked to be programmers or digital experts, then actually you can actually see folk for, uh, relaxing, you know, and, and not, not being quite so anxious about it. So we're more than happy to do the, to, to do these because it benefits everybody in the end. Yeah, no, thanks. I'm going to look forward to the 23 things um, tech coming out as well. So, so that's that's us for our, our speakers. And we've really just got to connect. A uh, question Q and A uh, that we can go into. We've we've got lots of questions, I think, in the in the chat. So I'll just kind of I'll, I'll look at these now and, and and we can try and answer some of them um, as they come through. Stephen has helpfully put them into to category. So in terms of there's a question here, I think, for me, just in terms of how how can the people being supported feel involved in the creation of feedback and and reports. Um, I think for our re reports, what what we try and do is speak, you know, record the views or or or, or quotes sometimes from from people we've spoke to in inspections, and I think that's a way that we show how people's experiences have informed our, our evaluations, you know, and 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 feedback. So that's probably the way we would do that, and I think probably you know in terms of this the, the project and feeding back to the children and young people, we're hopeful that in test. Three, third test of change, we will um, do an inspection with young inspection volunteers and involve them in, in the feedback, perhaps the video that, that we send to, to children and young people. So that's something we're, we're, we're hoping to do. There's 
questions for yourself, Emma. I think there's there's loads of questions here, I think, um, which I can go through. So we've got what programme is used for the virtual classroom? Um, it's just PowerPoint. We just use PowerPoint for it and it just links to, so we have a um, QR code that links to the PowerPoint and then within that PowerPoint it's just set as, um, there's a way that you can just set it so it's slideshow so they don't see all the other bits round about it and all they do is just click and it just takes them to another slide with either the activity or the video embedded or something like that on it. So it's there's loads of videos online um, on YouTube actually that tell you how to do it. Um, that's how we learned. <laughs> we just That's how we do a lot of things actually. We just Google it and how do we do this? Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of tutorials on YouTube that'll show you how to do it um, and it's quite straightforward. Um, but yeah, it's just PowerPoint. Thank you. Um, so, questions from Mark Stratton. Where are the videos picture stored so that the QR links to them? Um, so they're just stored as files. So we've got them on our laptops and our um, hardware kind of thing. Some of the videos you can link to the we use, depending on what the videos are, we use um, YouTube private secure links. So only the person with the link is able to view um, the the slide. And um, we use the Sway sometimes as well. Um, and because again, you've got the option there to only be the people that you allow to, to, to view it. So it depends on what the QR code is. Um, depends on where it's stored really. But um, it's it's the QR code is really just a way for you to access the information that you would give out to people in a different way. Um, so it's really just the, the, the access to it. Hope that makes sense. Thanks. No, I'm, st I'm sticking, because of the way the questions are, I'm going to stick with you, Emma, because um, oh, there's, oh. a, there's a, <laughs> <laughs> a hot seat. <laughs> on you. Um, there's an interesting qu question here. Um, do you feel this is taken away from personal interaction with children and families? So that question. I, from, I, did, so. I did see that um, and I've got to say no, I don't feel that. I feel like it was a way for us when we had to during COVID, it was a way for us to increase that um, connection with families and now it's just used, it's not the sole way that we, we do things, it's used as an additionality, it's used as something for those parents that we can't reach, that we can't speak to every day um, for lengthy periods of time, you know, or the ones that can't come in and out and pick up their children, they're still being able to access the same information it's just I would say more inclusive um but we're still getting that connection you know even when it's the, the sign in sign out um it's in the cloakroom so the staff are there and they're chatting to the parents while they're doing it but it just means that the parents aren't having to physically pick up a pen and sign the children in and out they're just doing it there and they scan it on their own phone it means that if we've got four or five different parents all in at the one time they can all scan the code and do it at the same time rather than having to wait for the, the folder to get passed around each parent to sign their child in and out so I feel that the the connection and the, the personal side of things is very much still there um, and it just enhances it really, I would say. Thanks. Thank you. So give you a break now, Emma. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a question for, who are we here? For Dan Heath, so um, for Amanda. Um, what is the company name of the big tablet? There we go. I was like, I think it's a Lenovo. 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 Um, yeah. Um, we had a donation towards it and then we raised the rest of the money ourselves by doing different things. Um, but they're over £4,000 to buy new but they are so, so worth oh, it. Yeah. Highly recommend them. Thanks, Amanda. You're welcome. I've got another question here for you. Um, do you think, let's oh, cover the question. Do you think any of the resources, devices you have shown could be used out in the community for clients to receive care at home, certain services, et cetera? Yeah, I can't see any reason why not. The tablets are great, um, you know, because you can use those through WhatsApp to do video calls. Um, it's far better than a telephone. And if a client at home's got a smart TV, 
you can connect it through internet to the smart TV so that if you do know a WhatsApp call, you can actually see the person you're speaking to on a bigger screen and that keeps interaction going a lot, lot better. Yeah, it's just more real, more lifelike. Um, that's yeah. great, thank you. Um, so I'm just looking at questions here. I think I think I'm back to you, Emma. There's one for about from Jane. Uh, I'd like to hear more about how the digital sign in out works. Yeah, um, we use Microsoft Forms for that. Um, so the QR code links to the Microsoft Forms page and it's just a question. Um, it's like a wee questionnaire basically and it's just who's signing the child in, um, what time did they arrive um, and then um, I think, I can't even remember exactly what's on there. I think there's contact number on it if it's different from the the, the, the contact number that we have for them already, um, emergency contact and then this who's expected to collect them um, and then on the sign out one it's who signed them out and what time they were signed out at um, and it just goes straight their, their answer to their questionnaire goes straight to the form so they have to put their child's name at the top that's one of the questions um is their child so they put the kid's name who's dropped them off what time that kind of thing all the information you would have on your um sign in sheet anyway um i did notice there that there was a question linked to that about the register as well for fire escape procedures we have a paper register as the children are coming in we'd get practitioners in the cloakroom welcoming them and as the children come in they tick them off on the sheet basically just to see how many children we've got in the building we use this for lunch numbers and stuff like that as well so the, the sign in sign out thing is really for us um for a protection of the safeguarding of the children as well and who's collecting them who's dropping them off that sort of thing and that's all stored and accessed using the, the ipad and the devices but the, the actual register that we would take out if there was a fire we, we left a hard copy of that and how, how long can you keep the, keep the data and QR codes? So if the codes are in a, a learning journey, how long would they be accessible for? Oh, that's, that's a question I don't know the answer to. I think it would just be until you changed it or until you deleted it, um, until you removed the data from the code. Um, then it would just be stored. I mean, you might be able to answer that question better than me, Nikki. I'm not no, sure. No, no, that's the, that, that's what I would think. As long as the link's still there between the yeah. the, the code and the um, the data that it's stored, then absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just navigate. Okay. Gordon, right? Is there any financial help for companies with new technology? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure myself of, of any that kind of spring to mind. I know there's lots of initiatives um that are out there for, for technology, you know, perhaps in terms of what Sterling are, are, are doing um with Frank Frankfield House. Um so yeah, but I think that's just about keeping your your ear to the 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 ground really um and seeing what, what's about. So you do you do hear a uh, there's another initiative, I think it was um, Build, which was connecting um, older adults using digital in care homes. So they're filing um, different things in adult care homes with virtual reality um, and things like that. But um, yeah, so don't know if anyone else, you know, in the speakers would like to come in on, on that one, just in terms of financial help for, for new technology. That's a good question. I mean, certainly for the ARCH project, we we secured funding through um, research councils, so we had that funding to get the kind of technological side built in as part of the overall bid for funding. But I know some other organisations that apply for small policy, small funding bodies and things like that. Um, I'm trying to think if, I thought there was a website where you could maybe find a list of funders that might help you with that kind of stuff. I'll see if I can find it and post it in the chat. Yeah, I'll do the same on that one because so you do hear of things at time limited um, funding or its applications that I think we've po we've posted some through our external again engagement with the care inspector when they've when they've come up i'm not aware of any at the moment but we certainly had one um last year which was an application process process for for funding around uh, 
digital, so we will post anything like that in the future. We will post on our external engagement um, as well. So uh, I'm just kind of scrolling through. If there's a question asked but not been answered, um, feel free to put your hand up. It'd be great to hear from somebody as well. Um, Yeah, I think that's just about covered us. Um, like some here different. Stephen, I'm not sure if I'm missing anybody. Hi, Nikki. There was a, a question from somebody regarding the plugin for the, um, the 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 laptops, and I have to say, unfortunately, I don't know the the, the answer to that directly. But what I can do, if you, I've put the the um, learning zone address in in the chat. And part of the learn when you go into the learning zone across the banner, there's the, one of the one of the options is my learning. And what I'll do is ask the guys who's responsible for that if they could put something in the FAQs to to see how folk can actually get 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 the download the plugin. Thanks, Barry. I think that's all the questions that came in through the Q and A. There, Nikki. Great. Okay. Well. Um... Yeah, just for me to say thank you. Thank you to everyone for, for your engagement. It's, it's been great to hear from, from all of you and the speakers as well. Really grateful to you. Thanks very much. Um, really uplifting just to hear about all the different strands of work that, that are going on out there. Um, and yeah, any questions after the, the event, um, please just get in touch with me. I'll post my, my email address in the the chat i'd love to to hear from you anything tech related um and i'm sure the, the speakers would be delighted to to get back to you as well so enjoy the rest of your afternoon thanks thanks again